All right, welcome everybody. Um, my name's Tor Allen. I'm uh, the host of this carbon conversation. Thanks for coming out tonight to the Grange. Welcome to the Grange. Um, how many of you have never been to the Grange? First time? All right, welcome. Um, so, before we get started with the main topic this evening, I just want to share a little background about the carbon conversations. Um, we started them back in 2019, a series basically, um, so it's, I run the Rahus Institute, that's a local nonprofit. Grange is hosting this. Um, basically the big goal for Carbon Conversations is to sort of shoot, explore solutions um, to adapting to climate changes and also uh, not making the problem worse and not potentially mitigating them, and also figuring out which ways each of us can find um, our role in working on this issue. I will say we're still working on trying to fund this series but, uh, sustainably, so I'll pass a hat if you did get a chance to throw in a few bucks um, just to keep it going. If you already have or pass it around. Um, so, Last month, how many of you were here last uh, February first for the? All right, yes. So that was awesome. It was uh, a look at 2050 and what our climate will look like uh, in, in that time frame. And I want to say that the um, website is. Oh, I didn't put the link here, but it's um, rahus.org forward slash scc. And then this archives go all that stuff that was presented last month is there, along with a lot of links that were shared in the, in the video. The video's there, plus some additional modeling tools. So if you want to go revisit that, that's all up there. There's also some links and recordings from earlier Carbon Conversations at that site. Um, yeah. So way back when, what inspired, one of the things that inspired us to do these Carbon Conversations <coughs> when Project Drawdown came out in 2017-ish, I think. And if you're not aware of it, it's this uh, resource. It's online now. It's a, it's a group of Project Drawdown. And they analyzed the top 100 solutions to reversing global warming. It's an amazing list. Um, and all have other benefits. So pretty fascinating um, resource to reference. They also keep developing new resources, um, including this video series called Climate Solutions 101. So I invite you to check those out. But that's sort of the uh, inspiration for continuing looking at different solutions here in our community is finding folks that are working on some of these things, bringing them here, let's talk about it, let's share, and see how we can amplify those, those solutions. Some of the next uh, few months, the topics are next month is we're going to look at electrifying your home um, and all the nuances of that topic. And then in May, uh, we have a, a local student who won uh, her own nonprofit to teach climate and is also going to share some of their activities. And, and another project with her, they developed an idle free. School, basically, a project where students develop that. Um, and then June, we're going to look at electric vehicles, electric vehicle chargers, and then a few little charging network developments. Um, so, what do we get out? What's the point of all this kind of thing? I think the goal is really to sort of the last one is connect and collaborate with each other, find connections with each other, um, and getting more and more of the community involved in climate uh, ac actions. So that's kind of the, and hopefully it'll shape some larger community activities here in, in Sebastopol and the greater region. <clears throat> so why rainwater cisterns? Um, this photo here actually is from about 12 years ago when we first moved to Sebastopol. These are my daughters out at Salmon Creek pointing to, it's the greenhouse there with a, a tank that was the rainwater cistern that was about, oh, I don't know, it's about a 2,000 gallon tank, maybe a little more. Um, but now they're, well, we stumbled across their, went to a visit there last summer, they were hosting a garden camp, and 
and saw this construction of this massive rainwater system that's being transforming at the school there. And so that was interesting. And then tied in over the years, I've seen uh, read about rainwater systems in Al Alcatraz Island. It started back in the 1800s. Uh, the Getty Museum down in LA has a massive cistern that is used for fire, fire suppression. Um, tree people in LA also have a uh, unique cistern, rainwater cistern. So, and then on top of that, our <clears throat> water comes to us in buckets, basically in the winter, all this winter water, and uh, how can we store some of it for the dry seasons? So, <clears throat> and then lastly, that, that video that we saw last month, it's, it pointed out that water is uh, something we need to take care of, take care of our watershed, so uh, let's take a look at this. Before I turn it over to our speaker, I want to thank uh, Ann and Sonoma Water for sponsoring this uh, event tonight. And we're going to hear more from Ann a little later. So, thank you, Ann. So, um, next up, I'm going to introduce John Green. Green, yeah. <laughs> What's my memory here? John's a lead scientist and program manager at Gold Ridge Resource Conservation District, and he's going to take us through a story about the Salmon Creek water story of uh, rainwater cisterns and more. So I'm going to keep going. Can everybody hear me if I don't use the microphone? Yeah. I feel like I can project pretty well. Um, that, that way I can move around a little bit. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my name is John Green. I work for the Gold Ridge Resource Conservation District. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Salmon Creek, uh, the Salmon Creek watershed and work that we've done um, over the last about 15 years out there to uh, improve stream flow. And the, the primary uh, method we've been using is to construct rainwater catchment to offset water that people are using from sources that impact the creek. Um, that's going to be the first part of my talk, and then the second part I'm going to talk about kind of the basics of rainwater catchment, like if you're interested in doing it, or you're just curious about it, the kinds of things you need to think about if you want to build a rainwater system, and what goes into planning. And, and um, I haven't given a presentation in about four years, so I'm probably a little rusty. I hope everyone forgive me if I stumble over my words a few times. Um, for those who don't know what resource conservation districts are, we are kind of, we're a local agency, technically part of state government. Um, we partner with the federal government and with all kinds of other agencies to bring funding in to do natural resource projects within our district. Um, so we work on a voluntary basis with landowners, agricultural, residential, commercial. Um, we've done a lot of work with the camps out in West County um, to do all sorts of projects that are um, designed to address natural resource issues. And one of the primary ones we've been working on for a couple decades now is stream flow. And I'll get into that in a minute. So Gold Ridge is one of two resource conservation districts in Sonoma County. We are just from basically the Laguna west to the ocean and from the Russian River south to Marin County. The rest of the, of the, of the county is the Sonoma RCD. And here's a little bit closer uh, map. You can see all the watersheds that we um, work in. Um, so we're right over here in Sebastopol. Sam Creek watershed is there. Um, we've done a lot of rainwater work out there. We've done a bunch in the Green Valley, uh, Green Valley Creek watershed, which is Green Valley, Tascadero, and a little bit in Dutchville. Um, we're starting a program out in Scotty Creek as well. And primarily, our uh, programs have been directed towards preserving and conserving um, endangered fish populations, specifically coho salmon and steelhead. Um, the Russian River population is part of a larger population, the Central Coast, and they are critically endangered. Um, in the Russian River, there were probably hundreds of thousands of fish that came back to spawn every year uh, historically, and by the early 2000s, they were numbering the single digits. So the, the population crash has been pretty dramatic. And it's been because of a variety of reasons, uh, among them habitat loss and ocean conditions and things like that. Um, before we started our stream flow programs, we did a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work to try to restore and enhance habitat in the streams. 
For those who don't know about coho salmon, the adults come in from the ocean, they go to the streams where they were born, they lay eggs, and they die. And then their eggs hatch out. The juvenile fish spend a year in the creek, so they go all the way through a summer season and the fall, and the following spring, they run back out to the ocean. Um, so they have to spend a year in fresh water before they go back to the ocean where they get to be you know, two feet long. Um, all the habitat work in the world, in the streams, is not going to help if the streams go dry in the summer. The fish out of water is just not going to make it. So um, as part of a larger program called the Russian River Coho Water Resources Partnership, um, we started addressing uh, water issues in the Russian River in around 2009. Um, and in Salmon Creek, we started a separate program that was around the same time. And like I said, the, the main um, strategy we've used is to build rainwater catchment sy uh, systems for a whole variety of different, different uh, sites and situations. Um, the typical system might look something like this. We have a whole bunch of 5,000 gallon tanks. At least this is the storage part of it, and it's collecting water off the roof. And I'll get into um, many of the details of that in a few minutes. So, the, the basic kind of background for this is that we live in a Mediterranean climate. Um, we have a really well-defined wet season, becoming less well-defined as time goes on, but we have a well-defined wet season and then a well-defined dry season. Um, in the winter we get so much water that people are worried about flooding and what are we going to do with all this water? And then in the summer everything is bone dry and, and all the way through the fall and these days you, you never know when the first rain is going to come. It might come in October or even September like this, this past winter. Um, it might wait till December, um, and with climate tra change affecting the timing and the amounts of precipitation we get, what we've seen is that the rainfall is more erratic, and more of it is coming in really big storms. Um, so this is kind of the, the basic problem, is that we've got this very well-defined dry season, which also coincides with our season of greatest water demand. So if you have streams that are already low because they're relying on groundwater to replenish stream flow during the summer, and then people go and sink a well right next to the creek, or they put a pump in the creek because they need water, you're just going to make that problem worse. So we started kind of at that point and said, how do we offset the demand that people are putting on either the aquifer or the creek or both? Um, and one of the best ways of doing it is to identify an alternative water source. So if you look at kind of the, the, the big picture, and this data is for Green Valley Creek, but it's very similar to what you see in Salmon Creek, average rainfall is going to be, uh, is going to deliver about 23,000 acre feet of water to the Green Valley Creek watershed every winter if you get an average rain year. Um, about 11,000 acre feet of that will flow out of the watershed as stream flow. The human water need is less than 1,000 acre feet in, in the Upper Green Valley watershed. Um, but that human uh, need all occurs, or at least a large part of it occurs, during the summer when the streams are already low. So if we can offset just a little bit of that, we may be able to keep stream flows up to the point where the fish are going to make it through the year. So, uh, like I said, we've, we've um, implemented or we've followed several strategies. The, the most basic and obvious one is to conserve water. You don't need new supply if you just use less. And in our society, we've been pretty good about identifying and implementing ways of reducing our water demand. We could be a lot better, but that's always the first step we take when we're looking at any site, any project. How do we reduce demand? Um, it's going to put less stress on the stream, on the aquifer, and reduced demand also means that whatever water, uh, water supply system we build, it's not going to have to supply as much water as it would if you didn't implement water conservation. So obviously this kind of stuff doesn't fly in our climate, right? Um, we don't live on the East Coast where it rains all year round. We don't live in Northern Europe. Big green lawns that are lush and, you know, kept green all summer are just a non-starter in, in uh, a Mediterranean climate. It's just a bad idea. Um, so that's kind of the extreme example of like, where do you find water to conserve? Well, in this case, I would just stop watering that lawn, let it die, <laughs> preferably let it go over to native grasses that are going to die and be brown, native plants, etc. But this kind of thing is, is sort of the extreme case of, of needing to identify water conservation measures. <clears throat> so overall water use, we do things like indoor water efficiency by installing low use fixtures and appliances, that kind of thing. Um, what I'm going to be focus on, focusing on tonight is more the outdoor practices. The rainwater systems that we build um, almost exclusively, probably exclusively, have been 
to provide water for outdoor non-potable purposes, so irrigation, livestock, stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. I'll get into, um, into those reasons a little bit later. Um, like I said, no green lawns. That's, that's kind of the, the first most basic thing. Lawns are really thirsty. Um, grass uses a lot of water, especially in our climate when it's really warm uh, during the summer. Uh, in addition to that, using native drought tolerant plants, installing more efficient irrigation like drip, that kind of thing, and then using gray water. Reuse is a big, is a big part of this uh, suite of approaches to the problem as well. So once water conservation measures are implemented and you can identify how much water you actually need on a site, then you start looking at alternative sources. And for our program, rainwater has been the primary one, but you can also look at things like, are there springs where the spring flow doesn't make it to the creek? We could tap into that spring during the winter, take some of that water, store it for future use. Timing of water extraction is another one. If you pump water in the summer when the stream is low, you're gonna have an impact on the stream. Like I said, in the winter, there's so much water around, you're like, well, what are we gonna do with all this water? We're flooding. If you can take some of that water, put it aside for the summer, then obviously you're going to eliminate your impact during the summer. And so the critical piece of this is constructing water storage. Because what we have is a, is a, a mis mismatch, right? A temporal mismatch. We have lots of water when we don't need it. We have very little water when we do need it. So when I talk about water storage, this is not what I mean. <laughs> um, you know, you hear a lot about this in California. We need more dams. We need no more big water projects. It's problematic on so many levels that I'm not even going to get into it. And I'm, I'm sure most people in this room know uh, that you know building dams is uh, it causes as many problems as, as it solves. In a place like West County, it would be even more complicated because you're talking about trying to get water from a centralized source to a lot of dispersed locations. The infrastructure costs in terms of getting the water there and then maintaining that infrastructure over time are just going to be enormous and it provides no local control. The thing with big dams is that we tend to allocate water based on an average year. What are we gonna do if we have a drought year? We've been dealing with this, or dealing with it in the Colorado River for the last 20 years. Um, we've been dealing with it in California as we go through drought after drought, where you have water that's been allocated to all these uses that's supposed to flow into a dam. You have a drought, there's not enough water for everybody. People start fighting over it. So in Salmon Creek, um, we have, uh, as part of our rainwater catchment program, we built um, 13 rural residential scale systems. And these are, I'm, I'm showing lots of tanks because they're kind of the most visible part of the system. But they tend to be in the range, of, well, to back up a little bit, we built 24 of these throughout our district. So Green Valley Creek, Dutchville Creek, Salmon Creek, and the Acero Americano. Um, 13 of these systems have been built in Salmon Creek um, out of all of the systems we built, the, the storage volumes range from 9,000 gallons to 84,000 gallons a year of water stored. Um, as I said earlier, it's all about, for us, it's been all about non-potable summer uses, so irrigation, livestock, et cetera. And again, um, we're replacing direct ver diversions and we're replacing um, extraction from wells that are near the creek that are going to affect stream flow. The important point in this slide is that all these systems are designed so that they fill in a drought year. You don't want to get into a dry year and then say, oh, well, we're going to have to fall back on our other source because our rainwater system didn't fill up. Um, we've also built uh, some larger systems. Um, the one on the upper right is at the Bodega Volunteer Fire Department out in the town of Bodega. Lower right is um, the Bodega Goat Farm, where, where the Bodega goat cheese comes from. Um, these have all been on either commercial or um, agricultural properties, and they range from 34,000 gallons, which is the, the fire department, up to 1.4 million gallons. So the thing to get out of this slide is that rainwater is very scalable. If you've got space to store water and if you've got um, roof to catch it off of or some surface to catch it off of, you can do it. <clears throat> One of our agricultural projects, we built this in 2010. Um, this is uh, a cow, calf, or uh, sorry, a replacement dairy cow operation out in Bodega. Um, we built a 235,000 gallon um, rainwater tank. It collects water off that big giant barn roof there. And then the lower photo is the tank, which is made up of these like seven foot culverts um, that are in five rows that are connected all on one end. Fills up in the winter, they use the water all summer. They don't have to use their water that's right next to their, their well that's right next to the creek. 
uh, the, the project that Tor was talking about, Sandra Creek School. Um, they are in the process of making some improvements to their campus, and one of them is to improve their soccer field. They want it to be more sustainable and more resilient in terms of their water supply. So they decided that they, we've worked with them for several years on this project to develop it and now to construct it. Um, they decided they wanted to do rainwater. So this system will catch water off all those building roofs in the background. They're all, all the buildings on the campus and store it in a concrete cistern, which is um, this big structure right here. And this is a picture of it from one end before it was before the backfill happened at it. Um, it's about 250 feet long, and 40 feet wide, and 14 feet tall, and it'll hold over half a million gallons of water. Um, important thing to understand about this system is that it is designed to fill up if it gets 16 inches of rain. So that's about as dry as you're ever going to see, at least as far as we know, out in Salmon Creek. So every year they're going to have the water they need to keep their soccer field at least fairly green, as well as any other uh, um, landscaping or anything like that that they need to, to irrigate. A big part of this project was the installation of drought-tolerant turf so that the, the grass that they're watering doesn't require as much water, and um, putting in a new irrigation system that is way more efficient than the old system was. Um, in addition to that, they're doing things like um, composting and aerating the soil so that it has more and more water holding capacity and things like that. So this is under construction. The top photo actually was taken today. Um, they haven't put in the, the grass yet, but they're working on it, and the cistern is just about done, and it's been collecting water for the last couple weeks. <clears throat> and then this is the biggest one that we built so far uh, at a dairy also out in Salmon Creek, outside the town of Bodega. Um, it catches 1.4 million gallons of water if we get, I believe it's 20 inches of rain. And they have about an acre of roof, and then there's the area of the pond on the left there. Um, that's all rainwater catchment surface, right? Water falling directly into the pond, water falling on all that roof is piped into the pond, and they have 1.4 million gallons of water each year. That's enough for them to keep their entire dairy operating for six months of the year, 7,500 gallons a day. Um, and that includes all the needs for, of the cows for water, 200 cows, and then all the dairy uh, operation water. Um, when you build a pond, one of the big things that can be a problem is evaporation. There's a lot of evaporative loss, especially in an area like Bodega where you get a fair amount of wind during the summer. So this pond actually has a floating cover on it to minimize evaporative loss. <coughs> so, um, any questions on the Salmon Creek stuff? I'm going kind to of go into more of the rainwater catchment specifics now. Yeah. I just have one question on the relative use of agriculture, water for agriculture versus domestic use in West County. What and the question is? The relative percentage. So, you know, for vineyards, you know, if we're trying to sort of target the significant, you know, if you if you if it turns out, and I don't know if it is, if it's mostly, you know, vineyards that's using a lot of water during the summer months when it's really super dry, is targeting, you know, domestic uses, does it make so much sense? Um, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know what the relative percentages are. Um, one thing that I can say is that, um, you know, typically in California, agriculture uses like 80% of the water, so it's a much bigger demand. Um, there are some areas that, in my opinion, shouldn't be farmed because they're essentially desert and you're importing water into them and causing all sorts of soil contamination problems and things like that. I don't really believe that's the case in Sonoma County because in a typical rainfall year, we'll get, you know, around, around the county, we'll get between 20 to 40 plus, you know, in some areas we get 60 inches of rain. So again, if you can figure out a way to store it, um, there is enough water to keep agriculture going. Um, as far as vineyards go, I know people beat up on vineyards a lot because, you know, there's a lot of them in the county and there are definitely times when you drive by a vineyard in the summer and you see sprinklers going and it's like, what are they doing? Uh, my experience working with vineyard operators is that most of the vineyards in this county are dry farmed. Um, they use a minimal amount of water for irrigation and the reasons for that have more to do with grape quality than with water availability. Um, so that's, you know, 
I'm not going to go any farther than that because I don't have that, that data. Um, but that is something to consider. Another question. Yeah, how are these projects funded? And that's a lot of money to go into. They do, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the, because in Salmon Creek we have endangered fish, there's a lot of funding that's been available over the last, say, 30 years to uh, restore those populations of fish. So we've tapped into funding from a whole variety of state and federal agencies and a few private sources and a few other kind of random sources um, to build these projects. The larger projects are pretty expensive. The residential scale ones, if you're not putting in a big steel tank, can actually be pretty reasonable. And we have a program now where we're helping people, aside from any impact on the stream, we're helping people just with water security. And my colleague, Noel Johnson, is here, and she'll be talking about that program after I'm done. Right. Um, but like the dairies, now that's a business, um, can we get? Yeah, so the, they'll put in a cost share. Um, we ask them to, to share the cost with us, and then we get grant funding. Um, and again, because it's directed toward improving fisheries and fish habitat, um, that funding is available. So we're like, well, if it's available, we're going to use it because we've definitely got a need. So since the whole river and all of its tributaries have historically been salmon habitat, does that mean that that funding is typically going to be available for anybody who wants to do a project like this? Not anybody. Um, you would have to go through either an agency or a nonprofit to get access to that funding. And what we have to show with these projects is that is that the the sites where we're doing our project has has an impact, or those sites have an impact on the creek. So, you know, like I said, direct diversions where people are pumping straight out of the creek, those are the low-hanging fruit. Um, in West County, I mean, I'm sure some of you are, are, know this, West County is extremely dry, uh, groundwater poor. Um, there's not a lot of groundwater in the western part of Sonoma County. And um, so what you tend to see is that people sink wells near the creek, in the creek's aquifer, what's called the alluvial aquifer. Um, those, those sites are also relatively straightforward for us to fund. Uh, but we do have to make the case that you know, the, the project that we're building is going to have an impact in terms of reducing the draw on, on the creek's aquifer. So la last question. Okay. Have you been able to see any sort of significant impacts on creek flow in Santa Creek due to all these cisterns in that watershed? Well, I don't have an easy way of answering that. A big problem we have with these, with these projects is that everybody, uh, all these agencies want to pay for the projects themselves. Nobody wants to pay for monitoring that will show whether they're effective. <laughs> because, you know, and, and it makes sense, because you have, you have elected officials who are approving the funding for these projects, and they want you know, they want to see dirt move. They want to see projects that are being installed on the ground. It gives them something that they can then take back to the constituents and say, we're doing some good with this taxpayer money that we're sending out to these groups. So it's really hard for us to, to um, show that we're having an impact um, because we don't have money to actually measure the impact. Now, another problem is that in order to show kind of the, the after project condition, you have to have a record of what conditions look like before the project. Stream gauging has historically not been a thing that we've done in this society. So what we do is we kind of fall back on sort of the common sense, like does this pass the smell test? If you're pulling water out of an aquifer that feeds a creek, it's kind of common sense that it's probably going to have an impact on the creek. Um, that impact may be really hard to measure, and it's going to vary from year to year depending on how much rain we get, or when the rain falls, or how hard it falls. Um, but what we kind of, like I said, what we kind of fall back on is that we're addressing these uses that we know are having an impact either directly on the creek or on the, on the aquifer that feeds the creek. And so that's the case we make, is that we're reducing that impact. Now there have been a few sites that we've worked on, one that's not in Salmon Creek out of Westminster Woods, um, where they were irrigating their athletic field by pumping straight out of the creek. And we actually, they've been a great partner for us to do a whole bunch of different projects over the years. We started the Coho, uh, the Coho partnership back in 2009. We went to Westminster Woods and said, "Hey, Dutch Bell Creek is one of our streams of interest. Can we put a stream gauge in on your property?" And they said, "Sure." And we put it in a pool under the bridge at the Westminster Woods camp, and it happened to be the same pool that their pump pulled out of. So every night or every couple nights, you would see this like huge drop in stream flow, sometimes pulling more water than was actually flowing on the surface. 
We went back to the camp and said, hey, do you know you're having this impact? And they were horrified. <laughs> they didn't realize what was going on. So we worked with them to design and build a project that eliminated that diversion completely. So they went from drawing about 120 gallons a minute um, most nights throughout the summer to drawing 0.3 gallons per minute in the winter from a spring that's not even on the main creek. And the way that we were able to achieve that water savings was by building 175,000 gallons worth of storage. Um, that's one where we can look at the gauge records because we put a gauge in and we recorded that impact and we can look at the gauge records and say, look, no more impact. We've improved stream flow. And then that improvement will kind of propagate downstream a certain distance before it gets kind of washed out by increasing stream flow just in general as you go downstream. Um, that was kind of a long-winded answer to the question, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of a hard one for us to tease out. So, so going back to, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about rainwater systems and kind of the things you think about and uh, the things you need to think about as far as design and planning a system and what we look at when we build a rainwater system. Going back to this earlier graph, again, the problem is you get all the rain in this season, so if you can capture some of that water and then store it to use during the dry season, that's the goal. So we've built this landscape that's really efficient at shedding water. We have lots of impervious surfaces. And so we create all this runoff, and it all goes into the creeks and into the rivers, and it causes floods, it does all kinds of things that we didn't intend for it to do. So the idea here is let's turn that umbrella upside down and catch some of that water, and then we'll have it during the summer when we need it. <clears throat> One of the first questions I always get asked is, is this legal? Is it, is it permissible under state law or federal law or whatever law to capture rainwater? Um, and in California, the short answer is yes, absolutely, it's legal. Anybody who tells you otherwise is wrong. And I've actually talked and worked with people who said, who have told me, well, somebody from the, the state water board came and, and we were talking with them and they said it wasn't legal because that water is going to end up in the creek and we would need a water right. Absolutely not true. Um, water doesn't fall under state jurisdiction until it gets into a natural channel or into a groundwater aquifer. Um, and, and that's only some aquifers. Um, and there's a, there's a reference to the state code if you want to look it up. So the simplest rainwater systems are rain barrels, right? You can go, the, the ones on the left, they sell them at Freedman's, I don't know, they're like $50. You can go buy a rain barrel and put it under your, under your downspout. Water runs off your roof into that barrel, and then you can either hook up a little pump to it or dip out of it with a watering can um, and water your plants or do whatever you want to do. And they come in all different, different varieties. You know, there's the, the kind of industrial ones on the left, and then there's the fancy ones that are made to look like wine barrels with a little pump that's probably not functional on top. <laughs> and then the, the do-it-yourself model on the right, which is uh, basically a Rubbermaid trash can um, that somebody's modified to run their, gut, their, uh, their roof water into. These are great, and especially if you live in, in town and you have very little space, it's not going to make a huge difference because you can't capture that much water in these, but it is going to make some difference. And again, what we're trying to do is, especially when we start talking about um, building these systems in areas where there's a lot of rural residential development or in, in town, we're trying to reduce kind of our overall impact on water. So doing this kind of thing, if you don't have space to do anything bigger, is always good, and I, I always encourage people to do it. Um, like I said, you're just not going to store that much water this way. The systems we build are typically, you, you'll see these green 5,000 gallon tanks, um, and we'll use multiple tanks. Um, this is kind of more typical of the rural residential or, or kind of residential system that we'll build. This is one out in Salmon Creek. It stores 15,000 gallons of water every winter. Um, what I found in building these over the last 15 years is that 15,000 gallons, if you have kind of an average to large garden and a little bit of landscaping, 15,000 gallons is going to be more than enough to get you through the whole dry season, from May through October, even November. Um, I built my own system. Uh, I, I live outside Sebastopol, and I have 20,000 gallons of storage. I've never gotten to the bottom of it. Um, and I have a, we have a pretty big garden. We water a bunch of fruit trees with it. Um, it. It goes a long way. 
Obviously, this is kind of the other end of the spectrum. I already showed this photo, but that's the 1.4 million gallons. And the point I'm trying to make here is, is how scalable this is. So I always tell people when, when I'm starting to work on developing a system with a, with a landowner, I always tell people there are really four critical, critical questions to answer. Um, the first one is, what's your target volume? How much water are you trying to capture? What, what do you need? And like I said earlier, all of our systems are designed to satisfy outdoor and non-potable water needs, usually for the period of May through October or June through November, so basically the entire dry season. The season when you're going to need to be watering your garden um, and you know watering whatever landscaping you have. Getting to that number can be tricky. Obviously, the easiest way to do it is if you have a water meter, and you can look at the six months from November through April, compare them with the six months from May through October, and the difference, you're always going to see it higher in the summer, the difference could be your target volume. And then maybe you add 10% or 20% to accommodate any future change in use or something like that. If you live in a place where there is no water meter, like you have a well, like, like I do, um, there are other ways of figuring it out. Uh, if you go online, you can find all sorts of information on about the transpiration rates, like what's the typical amount of water that a plant will use in a particular climate zone uh, on a daily basis. Same thing for livestock. Um, you know, you can look up cows, goats, even chickens and cats and dogs. They'll have standard water demand numbers for those. So that's another way that you can start to get at like what that target volume is. Um, and I always tell people, you know, add 20% to whatever your total is. So that, number one, you're accommodating any error you might have made, and number two, you're, you're uh, making it so that you can expand whatever you're doing in the future and still have enough water. <clears throat> so the second um, thing to look at is what's your collection capacity? And this essentially is roof area. Um, I think we've built one system where we're collecting off more than just a roof. Um, I don't really think it's advisable necessary to collect off, um, say, a driveway or a parking lot or something like that. You just have more likelihood of contamination. Technically, under the state code, you're not allowed to collect off those surfaces. You have to collect off, off of roofs. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, people build what they want to build sometimes, and if they're comfortable with it, I'm, I'm just like, well, yep. <laughs> It's your funeral if it's contaminated. <laughs> um, but yeah, so roof area is really going to be the, the basic um, thing to look at. So a thousand square feet of roof, one inch of rain will give you uh, a little under 625 gallons of water. And people are always astounded by that. You know, it, it's just one inch of rain. It's just that deep. But you spread that over a thousand square feet, which is smaller than your average house, um, you're getting 623 gallons of water every single inch of rain that falls. So if you have a 1,500 square foot roof and you get 25 inches of rain a year, you're going to get 23,000 gallons of water. Remember earlier I said 15,000 is usually about right for, you know, somebody with a big garden and a few trees and something and stuff like that. So that's a ton of water. As I said earlier, you always want to design for drought. Um, <clears throat> most of our systems, I just accidentally hit a button. Um, most of our systems are in areas where rainfall averages over 40 inches of rain a year. Um, we design for 25 in those areas. So it's, it's a fairly severe drought. Um, like I said, with Salmon Creek School, uh, 16 inches will fill that half million gallon cistern. Um, and again, the idea here is that you don't want to be without water during the dry year when you really need it. So drought year, um, you always want to be able to fill up your, your storage. And then the third thing, as far as, as far as your site goes, is storage capacity. How much room do you have to store water? Um, there's a lot of different things that go into that. There are other constraints. Um, things like uh, the elevation where you're going to put the tanks, whether there might be zoning limitations. There are all kinds of factors to consider. There are a lot of good resources on how to do it. But the basic one is physical space that you, you need to put in water tanks. This is a system we built in the town of Bodega. It's actually right next door to the fire department. And we had this narrow little, little space between the house and the property line. We lined up three 3,000 gallon tanks um, in that space. And that system fills every single year. And the woman who lives there has a really big garden and gardens really intensively. She's always had enough water to keep her garden going since we built that when I was 2010. 
So water storage comes in all shapes and sizes. Like I said, these are the, the typical kind of 5,000 gallon. You see these all over the place. Um, a lot of these tanks were put in by people who were told by the county when they were building their house, you have to have a fire, a water supply to fight fire. Um, that requirement has been dropped, so if you have one of those tanks, you could probably repurpose it for rainwater if you wanted to. Is that really true? Yeah, because... I've got a 5,000 gallon tank. Yeah, I would check with the county, but but they dropped the requirement, and, and the main reason for that is the the fire departments won't use that water because they have no idea whether you know a rat got in there sometime and drowned, and they don't want to pull something into their pump that's going to destroy their thirty thousand dollar pump. Um, so that they don't have that requirement anymore. And if you have one of those and you want to repurpose it, check with the county. It's it's entirely likely, I think, that, that they'll say, yeah, you can. Do whatever you want with that. What, what office of the county would you? It would be PRMD, Permit Resource Management. What's the diameter of? Those are uh, 12 feet in diameter and 8 feet tall. Um, and like I said, those are 5,000 gallon tanks. Um, these, this is a larger tank that we built at another site out in Salmon Creek. That's, I believe, a 34,000 gallon tank. It's about 27 feet in diameter and um, I think 8 feet tall. These tanks are way more expensive per gallon of water stored than, than the, the 5,000s. And just to go back to these, these, these green plastic tanks, um, you don't need a building permit to put them in. As long as they're 5,000 gallons and under, you can put in as many of these as you want and you never have to get a building permit, which is, which is kind of a big advantage because permits are complicated and they can be expensive. Um, you get over 5,000 gallons or over a 2 to 1 ratio of height to width and you need a permit. So we have to get a building permit to put in, to put in this tank. Um, we've built systems with landowners who wanted to do, we, we did one where there's 35,000 gallons of storage. They were like, we really don't want to deal with the county, we don't want to have to deal with permits. So we put in seven 5,000 gallon tanks. It's a little tank farm, but it works just as well as, as a big steel tank and it was cheaper. Question. Do you know approximately how long the plastic tanks last? I don't because I've never seen one wear out. <laughs> um, that, that's actually a really good question and I should probably see if I can find any information on it. They're made out of um, HDPE, high density polyethylene, it's UV resistant. Um, I know a lot of people are a little hesitant on plastic because they're worried about what leaches into it. Um, and I really don't have a lot of information on that either because we haven't done drinking water. Um, but I, I think that, you know, if you're worried about that kind of thing, the best thing to do is to look into filtration and see if any plastic that leaches in there, anything that leaches out of plastic can be filtered out. And also to work with, or, you know, check with tank manufacturers to see whether it's actually likely that anything will leach out. I have four of those tanks and I've never smelled anything odd coming out of it or anything like that. And they get pretty warm in the summer because they're in full sun. Can you do water testing? Because it's going to the food and stuff. I haven't done any, any testing. Uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm taking a leap of faith. <laughs> yeah, you have to believe in what you do. <laughs> um, if you don't have as much space, there are tanks that come in all different shapes and sizes. They can be tucked along fence lines and put under the eaves and things like that. They tend to be more expensive than the big round 5,000 gallon tanks, but they're a really good option for people who are, you know, who have a small lot or very limited space on their lot, that kind of thing. Um, and then these little pillow tanks are, you can, you know, like in this case, slide them under a deck. That tank is probably 500 gallons. Um, the disadvantage with those, those types of tanks is that you can't really clean them very easily, whereas the larger ones you can. Um, but if you have really limited space, this is a really good, good option. And those are actually um, uh, potable grade, so they are designed to, to maintain the water quality at, at a food level of um, a, a food level of, of uh, purity, I guess. So then the fourth question is how much will rainwater system cost? I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because the costs are so variable depending on how complicated your site is. Um, I think on average, when we've been doing the like three three plastic tanks and um, all the piping and stuff like that, um, it probably averages about thirty thousand dollars having a contractor do everything. I built my own, and it cost me about fifteen thousand dollars, and I did all the work myself. The biggest part of the cost was just the water tanks. 
So and that's as far as I'm going to go with cost because it's so variable. But if anybody wants to talk to me afterward, I can fill in lots of specifics. <clears throat> so then water quality. Rainwater is basically distilled water. Um, so the water you get off your roof is probably going to be better, especially after you've had a little bit of rain, it's going to be better than the water you get out of your well. Because it doesn't have, you know, West County, the big problem is iron and manganese and things like that. It makes the water all orange and smells bad and tastes bad. Um, rainwater is going to be a lot better than that because it's essentially distilled water. It gets evaporated and then precipitated. The only junk you're going to have in that water is going to be contaminants that are on the roof. You know, pollen, um, dust, bird poop. In Sonoma County, ash, um, you know, things like that, they're going to wash off the roof and potentially get into the water you're going to store. The way we deal with this is by taking a few measures that really limit the uh, amount of that stuff that can get into storage. So we put in, this is, this is a downspout screen. It's designed to keep like leaves and larger stuff out of the piping. And then below that, so I'm going that way. Um, you'll have a first flush diverter. So this double pipe right here, you can see where the water comes out of the gutter up here, and it'll flow straight down into this pipe, and that's the first flush diverter. All the water that comes off initially goes in there, and when it fills up, it spills over and goes into this pipe, which goes to the tank. Um, so all the goo and nasty stuff gets into that first flush diverter. By the time it fills up, you've got relatively clean water going to your water tank. And like I said earlier, all of our systems are outdoor and non-total. This is not drinking water. Um, generally, you don't need any more filtration than that if you're going to water your garden or, you know, uh, even even use water for livestock. <clears throat> but if you're going to take rainwater and use it for drinking water, it's essential that you have more filtration. Um, and I've worked with some landowners where we built a, a system that is for non-potable water. And they later said, well, we actually want to use this for drinking water because our water is really expensive. That's actually uh, a thing that's kind of common out in the town of Bodega because they have some of the most expensive water in the state out there from their water company. Um, and the people that I, I've worked with who have done this after the fact, they've put in like a double carbon filter <clears throat> and a UV um, disinfection, and they have better quality water from their rainwater than they do from, from the water company or from well water. So, I'm kind of wrapping up now. Um, these are the, the reasons why, in my opinion, why we should all be doing rainwater. Reducing your reliance. A big part of this is um, essentially giving yourself some water supply security and making your water supply more resilient to drought, especially. If you design a rainwater system in this part of the world, and you do it for a drought year, you're, you're always going to get the water because we've never had a year yet where we where we didn't get any rain. Um, when you have your own water supply, you're in control of it. You get to decide how it's used. I've always been amazed and impressed by how knowledgeable people become once they start looking into this. When we start working with a landowner on a rainwater system, it's like a, a whole world that opens up and people are really become more aware of where water comes from, what they're using it for, you know, they become aware of conserving, you know, people will put a bucket in the shower who have never done that before, things like that. It, it's, it's always been really impressive to me that when people have control over their own water supply, they become hyper aware of how water, you know, how water moves on the landscape and where it comes from. You know, the last 100 years or so, 150 years, we've had this paradigm where you turn on the faucet and water comes out and you don't have to think about it. But if you look at rainwater, I mean, people have been drinking rainwater as long as there have been people. Um, I just think that this is, in a, in a location like ours, with the climate we have, this is a no-brainer. Um, if you go to a place like Australia, you can't build a house without incorporating a rainwater system into it. They've been in long-term drought for around 40 years now in, in Australia. That's the direction that we're headed. If you're building a new house, Design it in. It's way cheaper and more efficient to do it when you're building your house than it is to do it after the fact. So that diversification of water sources, the independence, you know, kind of the awareness that comes with that, and then the fact that these systems are scalable. If you have enough roof and space, you can collect almost as much water as you want. Um, and then it's expandable. So if you don't have the money to do, say, 15,000 gallons, you can start with 
5,000. And then you can add another tank and you can bring in another downspout. It's really not that hard to do. And, you know, I always tell people none of it's rocket science. Um, I built my own and I'm not a contractor. Um, it's not that difficult to figure out. And then finally, the, the biggest reason for us is that we're protecting natural resources by, by using rainwater, by collecting rainwater. So here's some resources. Um, I think these are all good. The, the top two or three are the ones that I would recommend most highly for, um, for information on rainwater harvesting in particular. Um, but there's good information on all of those websites. And I think that's all I have. Oh. I'll leave that up there. So I'll, I will share those links. I don't know you're snapping that photo. But, um. Hey, thank you. Yeah, that was great. If anybody has any more questions, then I, I want to get Noelle up here. She can tell you all about our rebate program where we're actually People who want to build their own systems, we're helping them with design and we're helping them with the cost of construction. Um, question though. I use drip irrigation. How can I get the water out of my cistern and actually have enough oomph to do my drip water? With a pump. It's a pump? Yeah. How strong of a pump? Well, I have one that provides 40 pounds per square inch, which is, which is kind of typical water pressure for like a municipal system yeah. or a well. Mm -hmm. It costs me 500 bucks. Um, there are, there are a lot of irrigation pumps around that are on demand that don't require a pressure tank or anything. Um, they'll provide that kind of pressure. There are ones you can get for $175. They're, they're, not, that, they're not that expensive. And is there some special connector? Is it like a hose connection on the pump? Or? There are many ways of doing it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so well, two questions. One is uh, the filtration you mentioned, would that be for, for potable? Would yeah. that be before the tank, or so potable within the tank, or after the tank? After. Okay, after. Yeah. And then, um, you know, you have your downspout from your roof. Are you running into a sump tank with a pump to pump it into your tanks, or how are you creating the pressure to bring it from the roof into the above ground tank? So this is where we're getting into site design. It really depends on your site. Um, if you're, if you're, point where your water leaves the gutter and enters the downspout is higher than where it's going into the tank. You can run pipe underground and back up into the tank and it will flow on its own. Just think water finds its own level, right? You put it in over here, it comes out over there. I've had so many people tell me, I wanna, we wanna put our tank up on the hill so we don't have to pump to distribution. I always recommend against that because then you're pumping to storage. When is the electricity most likely to go out? <laughs> when it's raining hard, right? As, as we all know from the last month and a half. Um, so I prefer systems where we're filling the tanks under gravity and we're distributing under pressure. Then you have pressure wherever you need it and when, whenever you need it if you just have a pump. Um, I really don't like pumping to storage. It's, putting, it's building in a potential point of failure. And to me, that's a big no-no. <laughs> Do a lot of people use um, filters if they use a drip system just so there aren't little particles that get stuck in your drip system? Yeah, um, and that I should have added that. For, for drip irrigation, they have these, uh, they're, they're like a little um, bowl filter. You can get them at Harmony. They cost like $20, I think. Um, and they have different grades of them. but um, And they can advise you on which one is best for drip. But they're really simple. They attach at your hose bib. And they basically take any any small particulates that might clog up drip fittings out of the water. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious as to how uh, the work of people like Rob Dillon and um, Brad Lancaster and Jeff Lawton in the world of permaculture, um, how that fits in with your work in terms of more dealing with contours of land and creating rain catchments so it percolates and builds the aquifer and then replenishes the stream. So mm -hmm. how does that work for you? I mean, I see it as complementary, and, and I'm sure Brock can add to this because he's here tonight, but, um, you know, um, we're not taking quite as much of a holistic approach to a parcel because we're only interested in the water component of it. But one of the ways that we, we do kind of design in that way is we do things like taking the overflow from the tank, so like where does the water go when the tank is full? Taking all that water off the roof and you're putting it in one spot, and we make it so that we're infiltrating that water into the soil so that it's not running off, because the last thing we want to do is create like an erosion problem. 
Um, I look at the work that we do as complementary to the, or, or maybe integral to a permaculture approach, but I'm not a permaculture expert, and I don't know if you want to add anything, Brock, but um, it seems like a good question to me. No, we're all, we're all playing on the same team. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Are, do you have any projects coming up where you're um, actually going to treat um, the rainwater and use it for potable, and then um, just do a little more integrated system, and then you're going to use that so that you're taking gray water and then irrigating, so you're not taking rainwater and going direct to irrigation? Well, the one the program we have now that that um, is giving out rebates and helping people with design. We're also working with Daily Acts and with the Sonoma County Water Agency, and it, uh, some of those projects are going to integrate gray water. We haven't done that on a single site. We generally don't want to get that involved with the way that people manage water on their own property. Um, but that said, I, I think that kind of um, integrated approach is a good one to take. And you know, like I said earlier, um, reuse of water is a water conservation um, strategy. So you're reducing the amount of water that you have to store. You count on however much you're generating from laundry, from your kitchen sink, from shower water. Flushing toilets. Fl well, you can use it to flush toilets. You don't want to take the water that you're flushing the toilets. Right, but if you're using gray water to flush toilets. Yeah. There are issues with that, and, and this is one of the reasons we don't get into it as much. Um, if you do either rainwater or gray water to do anything interior, you have to have a dual plumbing system. And we really don't want to get involved in remodeling people's houses. Well, I was curious about that with the school. Yeah, with the school, they're really focused on on their soccer field because their buildings are already there. They don't have dual plumbing, so I don't think that they that they want to be set up to use it for flushing toilets or anything like that. Is the school also irrigating their massive garden slash farm? With that? No, that actually is not. As far as I know, that's not going to come from rainwater. They have a spring source that they use for for their um, for their garden program. And that's way away from the creek. It's a spring where probably none of that water ever actually makes it to the creek. And then you mentioned like the, the big question about how much water do you need that water audit sort of strata step. <laughs> Are any of these particular links provide some guidance on that piece of deciphering your needs, you know, when we don't really don't know? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I don't have an answer for that. I don't. Uh, there may be some on on the ARCSA website. Um, we've done water audits with people in the past. We tend not to get into those as much because, like I said, we haven't been addressing indoor potable or even any indoor uses. Um, but I think that's that's a really good way to start to get at your target volume. Well, I mean, all those things you're talking about—the your, your garden needs, your plants, how much to cut the trees, etc. It's a big spreadsheet, I think. So you start adding up. Yeah. What each one needs, but. Yeah, definitely. So I'll inject one more question. So the water for fire suppression potentially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. has that come up? Has that been part of any projects yet? Um, every time we build uh, one of those big steel tanks, we put a fire fitting on it so that um, if there is a fire and the, the fire department comes out, they can connect to it. Um, every fire chief I've talked to in West County, and there's been several of them, has told me we'll never use water out of a tank on I'm, somebody's property. I'm thinking more like the Getty Museum actually pumps water out of their cistern to a fire, yeah, like fire suppression system. strategy in the in the, in the Yeah, in and you could, you could do that. Um, that's not something that we've gotten into. Again, it, it's an interior thing, and we're, we haven't worked with anybody who's building a house from the ground up. Well, yeah, we, we do have fire sprinklers inside the house, but that doesn't help with wildfires. So yeah. it's more of an external, like your landscape, like your roof kind yeah. of strategy. That's and you could definitely use, you know, you're, if, you're, if you're pumping rainwater to distribute it, you could use that to keep your landscape wet if there's a wildfire. Um, you know, you're, you're going to be relying on power. Yeah. Just a quick question: How many units are on well? Yeah. Yeah, and again, you know. Um, 
You don't have to be in a place where you have an impact on the stream or where you're worried that your well is going to go dry to do rainwater. Um, for me, it's all about reducing our collective impact um, on our natural resources. So I have a well, I live you know, in the Laguna watershed, and I have a well that's reliable, and I don't really foresee a time when it's going to run dry. But I have a rainwater system because I have neighbors, and we're all pulling out of the same aquifer. And at the very least, I figure, well, even if I'm not having a direct impact on the creek, by using rainwater during the summer, I'm offsetting some of my neighbors' uses. And you know, if we all did that, then collectively we'd have a lot less impact on that aquifer. So, yeah. I wanted to add one point that a lot of people don't realize also with rainwater is it's a great strategy to help attenuate the flow when we have storms and we have, you know, we can flash flood our creeks, it can be very harmful. So by having the cisterns, you're actually slowing the flow, you're attenuating the flow. And particularly if you do have overflow going to a rain garden, um, it can really help um, with, with mitigating problems in our creeks and streams. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, what you're talking about is stormwater. I could go on for another 45 minutes about stormwater. We've, you know, I showed those two umbrella graphics. We've, we've made our landscape into the umbrella that sheds water, and we've engaged in a lot of really poor practices in terms of their ecological impact. We tend to pipe runoff and send it into the nearest creek, and then all creeks become flood control channels. Well, that's problematic because they didn't, they and the species that evolved in them did not evolve with these elevated flows. So I, I've, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to in the years that I've been doing this who say, well, we have this big erosion problem in our creek. It got deeper over the last few years, and now the banks are caving in. And my first question is, well, what's happening upstream? Well, you know, they built a subdivision up, upstream five years ago, and it's like, well, see, that subdivision has all these roofs and driveways and streets. It's all going into storm sewers. That's all flowing down the creek. That creek is going to respond to that because it's now more erosive. It's going to dig itself deeper, and then the banks are going to start caving in because they got too steep. Um, there are rules now about um, stormwater retention, um, but we already have this built landscape that has all this impervious surface in it. So every time we take some of that additional water out off the landscape and put it into a tank, we're at least in a very small way trying to address that problem. Hey, Anna. Will you come up here for a second? Don't worry, it won't hurt. Sure. <laughs> Anne's from Sonoma Water, and among other things, she, uh, I just wanted to ask your thoughts on um, how this plays in. Because Sonoma Water has this big picture, water stewardship of providing water to our communities. How do you feel about rainwater, this rainwater system stuff? Oh, we love it. We're part of the coalition that's helping fund this. I mean, it's really critical that um, uh, we were, t I was talking to someone earlier who was asking about water availability for new homes, like new development. Um, and in this areas that Sonoma Water serves, which are pretty much the, the cities along the Highway 101 corridor, but also Sonoma, Petaluma, which is along the corridor, North Marin and um, Marin Municipal Water Districts. Um, and um, we were talking about growth. And one of the things that people um, don't, may not know is that, uh, in gosh, about 20 years ago, Sonoma Water was providing about 60 to 65,000 acre feet of water annually to people in those cities. Now we're providing between 40 and 45,000 acre feet of water. And it's because the per capita consumption of water has dropped dramatically. Because people in these urban areas, through the partnership primarily, um, and City of Santa Rosa, these, these um, municipalities have done a really amazing job of getting tools out to the community, which is, you know, once you have a low flow toilet, once you have a water efficient washing machine, once you're using um, potentially a gray, a gray water system or rainwater catchment, it's kind of built in now. It's constructed into what you do. And of course, we're doing a lot of education on you know, just water saving practices. So those tools haven't really been available to rural residents. I'm one, I know. I have never gotten a rebate for anything. 
Um, and um, I would love a rebate um, for something. But um, but um, so I mean, it's a really important um, piece of this of just our overall water use. And it's it's one water, you know, whether it is water that goes into a septic system or a sewer system or whatever, it's all one water. We're using the same water over and over again. So we have to treat it like that. So we're totally supportive of these kinds of programs. Yeah, they're great. And Sonoma Water's been a great partner for us for decades now, I guess. Yeah. Um, helped support the Russian River Co partnership. Um, have the, uh, you all provided grant funds for some of our projects. Um, we, we feel like we're all really on the same on the same team. <laughs> so on that note, I want to thank you both and thank everybody for.